tardes, buena tarde. Uh, good evening. Uh, dear Professor Jules Lamrod uh, McCracken, College Professor of Business Economics and Public Policy and Professor of Economics at the University of Michigan. Uh, dear Professor García Milá, uh, dear students and members of the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to give you uh, this evening a warm welcome to Banco Sabadell, and particularly I wish to express my sincere thanks to Professor Lambrot for participating in the 28th edition of the Barcelona Graduate School Lecture Series. Uh, the topic of the lecture, Policy Insights, Uh, from a tax system perspective is one of which Professor Slebro is a renowned expert as an academic with a long and impressive list of publications uh, and experience. However, Professor Slebro is also an active practitioner, having acted as a consultant to countries and international institutions all over the world. Uh, this makes Professor Slebro's presence here tonight really special, and we look forward to hearing his insights on uh, key fiscal issues that are currently uh, of particular relevance Uh, especially in the U.S., in Europe, and in Spain. Uh, so I hope you all enjoy this uh, privileged evening, uh, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Tomas. So uh, today I have the honor to be the presenter of Joel Slendrup. Um And uh, as Tomas already said, that he is a professor at both the business uh, school and also the economics department, I would also like to mention that he's the director of the Office of Tax Policy Research, which is a very influential center. So, and actually, uh, these days, he's chair of the Department of Economics. Uh, I don't know for how long, but uh, he's been there since nine, uh, 2011. And I think he's looking forward to finish that uh, part of his uh, job. <laughs> uh, well, summarizing prof Professor Slamroth's uh, CV, is actually a very, uh, a very complicated tax, task because uh, he has uh, many contributions and achievements and his CV actually uh, is 34 pages long. So uh, I'm not going to go through that, <laughs> otherwise we would be here until midnight. But let me mention that it includes 16 books. I think I counted those correctly. And many articles, uh, over 150 articles published in the most Uh, prestigious and top journals in the academic profession. So it's very impressive. He has been uh, president, he, he has a lot of honors and positions, but let me just mention a few that I think are very relevant. He has been president of the National Tax Association, editor of the National Tax Journal, and co editor of the Journal of Public Economics, and he's presently associate editor of the International Tax and Public Finance and it's serving in editorial boards of eight other journals. The list of awards is also very long. And I would like to mention the first, he had an early start because he had an award, the uh, National Tax Association Tax Institute of America Doctoral Dissertation Award. So with his dissertation, he already got an award. Walking through his CV, you can see that he's got a lot of awards, but probably the most uh, recent and very prestigious one is the Daniel Holland Medal awarded by the National Tax Association in 2012. Uh, that's uh, for outstanding contributions to the study and practice of public finance. And I think indeed Professor Lambrot deserves the award. He has made important academic contributions and has provided advice to many governments and institutions. Professor Lambrot's work covers almost all aspects of tax policy and does it in a very thoughtful and rigorous way, addressing at the same time relevant policy questions. He has also fostered multidisciplinary studies of tax policy research, trying to bring together and trying to acknowledge each other professions of the economists, accountants, lawyers, journalists, and practitioners, practitioners and policy makers, so uh, at least try to uh, get them know each other and try to work uh, in the same direction. One of the areas where Professor Lambrot has made major contributions is in tax evasion and in tax compliance, both at individual and corporate level. He has worked not only on measuring the importance of tax evasion and the difficulties of measuring the invisible, 
as it states in one of his uh, recent papers, he has also measured the cost of tax compliance. Going through his uh, work and uh, revising some of his uh, titles, it's actually interesting to, so to see some of the titles of his papers. And one uh, catches the attention, actually, uh, probably for good reason, he finally got uh, the Ig Nobel Prize in Economics. This is awarded uh, by the Annals of Improbable Research to recognize research that cannot or should not be reproduced. Let me uh, read the title of that paper, Dying to Save Taxes, Evidence from State Tax Re Returns on the Death Elasticity. I'm not sure I want to know a lot about that paper, but uh, there you go. It's uh, really a catchy, uh, and actually was published in a very in a top journal. So uh, uh, it's a very important contribution. He has advised uh, international institutions and governments all over the world, IMF, the World Bank, OECD, government, several governments, many governments, among them Canada, Norway, or Portugal, and several states in the United States, and of course, the United States, the, the country, uh, at different level, at different positions and for different institutions. He's continuously giving advice to policymakers. So when I was thinking, you know, preparing this uh, presentation, I thought, well, I wish that he could also give some advice to the uh, very important tax reform that we need in our country, and also give some of his expertise on trying to avoid the large tax evasion that we have. Um, one of the things that distinguishes our country is that we are at the top of the list in the tax evasion in Europe. So maybe Joel could help us in doing something and trying to improve that. Let me just, uh, to finish, uh, mention uh, one of his uh, books that has been a reference. Uh, it's called Taxing Ourselves, A Citizen's Guide to the Great Debate Over Tax Reform. It's going through the fifth edition and has been translated even to Japanese and Chinese. Before I finish, I would like to put a, a personal touch to my talk because uh, when Joel was a very young assistant professor, I think it was his second year in Minnesota, I arrived there to do my PhD. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I was in this macro time series, rational expectations, trendy macroeconomics in Minnesota, and never took a course from him. But I did not know then that his lectures would have been really very useful, uh, especially to my late incursion in public finance. So I think it's never too late to learn. So here I am, I am and with you uh, in this uh, room to benefit from his Barcelona GSC lecture today, Policy Insights from a Tax System Perspective. Thanks very much, Joel, for being here with us today. Well, thank you for that, uh, those two wonderful introductions. Uh, when I hear introductions like that, I, I wish my um, parents could have been here because my, my father would have been very proud and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> uh, I want to thank um, uh, Bank Sabadell and the Graduate School of Economics at Barcelona for inviting me uh, here to this wonderful city. I've been to Bar this is my second time to Barcelona. I was here once 40 years ago. And when I tell people that, they say, well, it must have changed a lot. And um, I guess it did, although I was a student at the time and didn't really notice much. I do remember, though, I came at a very critical time in Spanish politics. It was a few weeks after, I don't remember the man's name, the second in command to Franco had been assassinated. And I was here a few weeks after that. And it was a very tense time. And um, one thing that's changed is I think it's safer here because I was on a, a tram or a bus 40 years ago, and a, a young man stood up with a pistol and started yelling in Spanish. And I'm thinking, well, this is where I'm going to die. I'm going to die in, in lovely Barcelona. But uh, at the next stop, he just jumped off and never shot the gun. So I feel much safer. 40 years later, and I, I, love, I love the city. I hope to come back again next year when I'll be in 
sabbatical in England, and my wife will be with me. I'll come with my wife for the third time, not 40 years after the second time. So um, I'm going to begin by talking about some tax phenomena that uh, maybe we don't see much uh, connection between them at the beginning of the talk. But if things go well, by the end of the talk, we'll, be, we'll have a framework where we can uh, put a lot of these things together. So the first one I want to talk uh, phenomenon is an, a new type of motorcycle that was introduced in a country that had three wheels and had long benches at the back seating up to eight passengers. Okay, what does that have to do with tax, you might be thinking. And in, a, in another country at a different time, a redesigned panel truck that had glass windows instead of panel windows like you'd think of in a panel truck and had upholstered seats in the back. Both were designed to avoid high taxes on cars. So by changing the, um, uh, the, the makeup of these vehicles, they just were on the, non, the low tax side of, uh, of being a car. Next phenomenon is an income tax is based not on income, but for example, for restaurants, the seating square footage and the number of tables. Simplified tax rules or no tax at all levied on businesses below a certain size. Very common around the world. The commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service testifying before a congressional appropriations committee in the United States that if they were appropriated, say, another billion dollars more, it wouldn't increase the deficit by a billion dollars. Rather, it would decrease the deficit by six billion point three because the every additional dollar added to the IRS budget would generate seven dollars and thirty cents in additional tax revenue. Tax experts declaring a value-added tax as a self-enforcing tax administrator's dream, while the same people deriding the retail sales tax, which according to our textbooks is equivalent to a value-added tax, as not acceptable under usual standards of equity and intrusiveness. By the way, many of you will know that the United States is one of the few countries left in the world without a value-added tax, while 45 out of our 50 states have a retail sales tax. In the United States, the self-employed remit only 43% of their true tax liability, so have a 57% non-compliance rate, while wage and salary earners remit 99%, so have a non-compliance rate of 1%. And finally, uh, this one I, uh, allows me to tell a story about my family, but let me first uh, tell you what the phenomenon is. U.S. corporations making substantial real investments in Puerto Rico, a territory, not a state of the United States, in electronics, pharmaceuticals, and high fashion production. Three industries which are, which are not generally considered activities in which Puerto Rico has a comparative advantage. So by the end of my talk, I hope all of these things will be clear, but the reason I get this has to do with my family is several years ago, we took a family vacation in Puerto Rico. We get to the airport and we start to drive where we're staying. My kids at the time were probably 19 or 19 and 13 and or probably maybe even less than that. And I was saying, you know, this is a great exercise in, in taxation. Look at, at the corporations on the side of the road. It's American electronics companies, American pharmaceutical companies. Why do you think they would be in Puerto Rico? And of course, you can guess their response. Dad, shut up. It's a vacation. Don't talk about <laughs> taxation. And then uh, it was New Year's Eve and um, as in many newspapers, they on New Year's Eve, they had a summary of the big stories of the year. And the number one story was the threat that the United States would change its tax law to disfavor uh, investments in Puerto Rico. And I brought this in to show them. And of course, they had exactly the same response. Um, so the point I want to make tonight is that the standard uh, models we have of tax analysis struggle to explain and illuminate these particular tax phenomena. And I'll try to uh, explain why and 
try to begin to construct what I call tax systems analysis that can handle uh, these issues and others. So let me first say something about the modern theory of taxation, which I date to about 1970 with the seminal contributions of Nobel laureate uh, James Murleys and Peter Diamond and others. And it was really a breakthrough in how economists address the issue of taxation. With some exceptions before 1970, uh, policy discussion and analysis of taxation was very loose. It, you would evaluate tax systems on the basis of fairness and how they, it would affect the economy. But loose language and loose definitions of, of these terms, which uh, I think does not facilitate intellectual progress. So starting about 1970, tax analysis uh, was grounded in rigorous uh, uh, models uh, of the world and how tax affects the world. But of course, like all models, they're stylized. They explain some aspects and encompass some aspects, ac aspects of the world and not others. And you can guess that I believe that they emphasize certain aspects of taxation at the expense of the sort of issues that I began my talk with. So let me tell you what, what I think the limitations of this standard analysis is. I am not in any way denying the incredible contribution of the modern theory of taxation. But it's been 40, 40 years when I was here, uh, coincidence, I think, um, since uh, that analysis. And I think it's time to move on. So here are what I think are some limitations of the standard model, standard toolkit for anal analyzing taxation. There's little attention paid to the administrative and compliance costs of taxation, which are not trivial. Uh, in the US, I believe the compliance cost of taxation is on the order of 10% of income tax revenue, so that is certainly not trivial. The administrative costs are much lower, and our, our Internal Revenue Service will also often talk about the costs of taxation, of collecting taxes, as being just the administrative costs. So they will divide the budget for the IRS by the amount collected, and that's about 0.5%. And they'll say, well, this is a tremendously efficient system. It costs 0.5% per dollar raised. But we know now that the compliance costs, the costs borne directly by taxpayers and third parties, to be at least 10, perhaps 20 times higher than that. So that's a big underestimate of the true cost of a tax system. There is a, this has been a discussion predominantly in developing countries about so-called tax handles, which means taxes which are relatively easy to raise with limited administrative resources. And of course, there's always limited administrative resources. Second limitation is a focus on tax rates and to a lesser extent tax bases, which is fine and important, but to the relative exclusion of all other tax system instruments, which by what I, uh, and what I mean is enforcement tools. So things like audits. How much auditing should a tax authority do? Who should be audited? What, what penalty should there be for evasion? What about loopholes? Uh, how do we think about uh, whether to allow loopholes to per persist? Another example of an enforcement tool is public disclosure of either people's income tax liability or tax liability generally, or disclosure of people who are thought to have evaded taxes. You probably know that in many Scandinavian countries, there is public disclosure of income tax and, uh, liability and taxable income and wealth tax, wealth tax liability. And in Norway, you can just go on the internet and find out everybody's uh, taxable income. When I discovered this fact, I was in my office in uh, Michigan, and it was a Norwegian postdoc who uh, was with me, and she told me this. And I immediately said, well, let's go look up the taxable income of Agnar Sandmo. Now, that's probably just an in-joke that only a few of you get, but Agnar Sandmo is a professor who has been the one who has initiated the modern economic study of tax evasion. And I know him well. He's a wonderful man, but that was the first thing I did as I looked up his income. At the time, it, you, you had unlimited, uh, you could do unlimited searches. Since then, uh, it's a little bit harder to get uh, the information. You have to have a password. I probably couldn't do it anymore. 
Three, uh, and limit, third limitation, a focus on what might be called real behavioral responses to taxation, meaning labor supply or savings or uh, choice of job, to the relative exclusion of avoidance and evasion responses. And I think in many situations, not all, in many situations, the avoidance and evasion responses are at least as important as the real behavioral responses. And they often interact. That is, to understand the effect of the tax system on labor supply, you need to know who's actually remitting the taxes they owe and um, other details of uh, avoidance opportunities. In the classic paper on optimal income tax, by James Murley's 1971, uh, the only decision that people make is how much labor to supply. So there is no issue of avoidance and evasion responses. And I mentioned that Agnar Samo was one of the authors with uh, Allingham of the uh, classic seminal article on the economics of tax evasion. Another limitation of the standard analysis is there is a recognition of the central role of asymmetric information in taxation, asymmetric between the government and private citizens. But the assumptions that are made about the asymmetric, asymmetric information are very extreme. They're on the extremes of any reality regarding what is measurable by the tax authority without cost and what is not measurable at any cost. So again, in the classic seminal article on income taxation by Murley's, the key quantities are income, labor income, and people's ability or effort. And the assumption is that the government can measure income perfectly and without cost and cannot measure ability or effort at any cost. It's a great place to start. But of course, the reality is somewhere in between for both income and ability or effort. The tax authority can, can't measure income without cost, often, maybe almost always, and can measure ability or effort imperfectly, but at some cost can measure both. So I'm going to argue that a tax systems analysis wants to get, should go beyond these extreme assumptions about the asymmetry of information between the government and the taxpayer. Another limitation of the standard toolkit, which I have begun uh, recently to think is actually quite important, is there's no meaningful role for firms. If you read the standard optimal tax literature, modern tax literature, you won't see firms mentioned. Why? Because in the early days, in order to make progress on modeling taxes, a particular assumption was made about production functions that there was constant returns to scale. And uh, most of you probably know that when there's a constant returns to scale production function, the scale of, a give, of one firm is indeterminate. It could be one firm producing everything. It could be lots of firms producing a small amount. The firm size is indeterminate and irrelevant. Well, this is actually a major limitation of a model that wants to look at taxation, because we all know that in all modern tax systems, firms play an important role. Firms are providing information reports to the government about labor income. They're withholding tax for labor income tax and other kinds of taxes. And it's a lot easier for a tax authority to deal with bigger firms than small firms. I hope as I talk you're seeing the connection to some of the tax phenomena I started with. So for example, a hint is that if there's a fixed cost element for the government in dealing with firms, there is you start to see a reason why it might be optimal for the government to explicitly or implicitly ignore the small firms. But we, in the standard toolkit of tax analysis, we can't get at this kind of issue because we don't have small firms or medium-sized firms or large firms. And I tell my graduate students that uh, when they have to pick two fields at Michigan, I tell them, well, of course, there's no question you'll teach, you'll take public finance as one of your fields. But I uh, encourage them to take industrial organization as a second field so they can start to think about how to integrate more serious models of the distribution of firm size, et cetera, with tax issues. No concern with the details of tax remittance. So if you have taken undergraduate public finance, you will have run into a folk theorem which goes as follows. 
the effects of taxation uh, on output, on who bears the burden of a tax, does not depend in any way on whether the tax is imposed on the buyer or on the seller. It's a folk theorem, meaning it's stated as if it's obvious, but it's never actually stated formally about what conditions must be true in order for this folk theorem to be right. And one suspects that it isn't right because in every modern tax system, it is firms that are remitting tax for the most part and individuals which are not, even in a retail sales tax in the United States, it's the retail firms which remit the tax, not the uh, consumers, the customers. So just by looking around, we can tell that it's probably not irrelevant. So I want to argue that a tax systems perspective can provide insight into these issues and other important issues, and then eventually we'll, I'll come back and we'll go through the tax phenomena. So I'm, uh, the title includes the term tax systems, and I've been talking about that, but I haven't told you what I mean by that, so now I'll do that. So what do I mean by a tax system? Well, a tax system has th is a set of rules, regulations, and procedures that do three things. One, it defines what events or states of the world trigger tax liability and how much tax liability. So this is sort of the standard uh, concern of tax analysis. So this is about tax bases and rates. But now I want to add two more things. A tax system also specifies who or what entity must remit that tax and when. I call that remittance rule. So this is what a textbook will tell you is irrelevant. But every law says it, you know, it doesn't just say what income tax liability is. It says whether a firm has to remit the tax, whether the individual has to remit the tax for retail sales tax, uh, whether it's the retail business, under a value-added tax, of course, it has to specify which business has to remit the tax. And the third thing a tax system does is it has to detail procedures for ensuring compliance with the tax rules, including information reporting requirements and the consequences of not remitting legal liability. So I call those enforcement rules. So a tax system is about tax bases and rates, so is regular tax analysis. The tax system analysis is also about remittance rules and enforcement rules. And the standard analysis presumes that tax and, uh, liability can be ascertained by the government costlessly and collected costlessly, in which case the second uh, statement here is irrelevant and the third statement is unnecessary if everybody pays what they know what they owe then certainly we don't have to worry about enforcement rules but I think we could all agree that just uh, thinking about one without two or three is not addressing the world that we live in so uh, in a tax system analysis we're going to recognize that there are people I don't know about in Spain, but in the United States, who just remit their tax liability dutifully, and they never think strategically about whether they should remit or not. But then there are others who think about this as a tactical decision, a cost-benefit analysis, and who remit their liabilities if uh, the odds go in that direction, and they don't if the odds of uh, successful evasion seem favorable. We're going to take seriously that taxpayers will rearrange their affairs to legally reduce their tax liability, including efforts to reduce their liability without altering their real activities. So the first I'll call evasion. It's illegal. The second I'll call avoidance. These are legal things that uh, people do to lower their tax liability. That is the standard dividing line between evasion and avoidance. There are, of course, situations where it's not clear whether it's something is avoidance or evasion or whether it's a little bit of both. We're going to recognize that limiting avoidance and evasion is costly. It's costly uh, to the government and because of direct compliance costs to the taxpayers and the tax authorities have limited administrative resources and the tax authorities have multiple but again limited policy instruments. So it's not only the rates and the bases, it's the auditing rules, it's the uh, penalties for uh, detected evasion, it's uh, whether to have the disclosure or not, it's whether to uh, how much information to require of a taxpayer when submitting the tax return. 
I won't talk about this much today, but a tax system analysis would recognize that taxpayers have cognitive limitations. And I think in this group we can also recognize that tax policymakers have cognitive limitations. And finally, the world is complex, and that complicates the collection of non-capricious taxes. The word non-capricious is important here because it's pretty easy and uh, low cost to just capriciously have tax burdens, just you know, randomly assign tax liabilities. That's easy to run a tax system like that. What makes it more costly is that we have views about that tax liability ought to be related to, say, people's income or level of wealth. And some of the uh, complexity comes because in all modern tax systems, the tax system is used not only to ascertain a fair tax liability, but it's there to achieve specific social goals, like encouraging charitable contributions or encouraging research and development more than there otherwise would be. All those things complicate the tax system because the tax system is more than just raising revenue. It's trying to achieve particular goals. Okay, so uh, well, let me go back. I have this slide. How am I going to do this? I'm going to talk about the building blocks of tax systems, multiple behavioral responses, multiple sources of cost, multiple tax instruments. I'll talk a little bit about one of the hottest issues in the academic study of taxation, tax-based elasticities. And then I'll talk about optimal tax system, which just means what can we say about what a tax system should look like, about the standard tax instruments, rates, and bases, about these new tax instruments, now, I don't mean new to tax authorities, but new to the analysis of taxation. And finally, I hope I'll have time to talk about implications of the information revolution, which could be substantial, because after all, at its heart, what taxation is about is information, the asymmetric information between the government and the taxpayer. If the government knew everything about taxpayers costlessly, it would be an easy job. They don't. And so the asymmetry of information is important. So if information is key to taxation, and we admit there's been and is an, a revolution in information, we better think carefully about the implications of that revolution for tax policy. Multiple costs. Well, one cost is the administrative cost. This is easy. It requires uh, non-capricious taxes, require a costly bureaucracy just to verify a payment and collection, but of course for any given objective there are more and less effective ways for a tax administration to operate. For example, the tax administration can be organized uh, by taxpayer, so individuals have one group in the tax authority, corporations have another, could be re uh, by tax, individual tax, corporate tax, value-added tax, it could be by the type of taxpayer, so many countries I, don't, I admit to not knowing much about the Spanish tax system, I apologize, but it could be that there is a large taxpayer unit which deals with rich individuals and big corporations, so it's across taxes, across the type of taxpayer. So what are the kinds of questions that one would ask? Should I already mentioned the first bullet, how, how should a tax administration uh, be organized? I'll talk about the second uh, bullet. There are important procedural differences across tax systems, including the degree of self-assessment, how much a country relies on the taxpayer's um, provision of information to the tax authority, how much uh, income withholding is used, and how much um, of arm's length information reporting there is of tax liabilities to the tax authority. In the US, uh, a firm has to report how much income they paid their employees. They, they, uh, many banks have to report how much interest in, they paid to their uh, policyholders. In other countries, information reporting is extended much more widely. As of 2011 in the United States, credit card companies have to report to the tax authority how much businesses that use credit cards received through their credit card. So if I'm a restaurant and I collect money through MasterCard, MasterCard now sends at the end of the year a report to the IRS about how much they collected on my behalf. So they've expanded information reporting um, 
quite substantially in recent years. So what facilitates administration? Having market transactions facilitates um, tax collection. I'll skip the modified cost assertion for now. Administrative cost is a function of the physical size, the tangibility of the tax base, the visibility, the mobility of the tax base. For example, it is, and history shows, harder to tax diamonds than windows. So if it's not easy to uh, move a tax base, it's more susceptible to taxation. Whether there's a registration of the tax base, whether the number of, there's a lots of small tax units or a small number of big tax units. Administrative cost is an ex increasing function of the complexity, the lack of clarity of the tax law, and of course it's true, it's a function of how often the tax system changes. Because even a bad tax system, the taxpayers eventually learn to understand how it works, and switching to what in the long run might be a simpler tax system is going to be more complicated in the short run. Then there's compliance costs. These are costs borne directly by the taxpayer or directly by a third party. So for example, the employer that's doing information reporting and withholding for their employees, they bear some costs. They, as I said, they dwarf administrative costs, 15 or 20 times higher at, uh, for the taxes we know about. Of course, the burden may be shifted just the same way a tax on a corporation might be shifted to the customers or their employees. Compliance costs borne initially by a firm might be shifted uh, to customers or employees. How do we know about compliance costs? Well, we know about it basically through surveys. Um, we ask people and we ask corporations what, it, what their compliance costs are. And of course, there could be bias. Not everybody returns these surveys. We don't know for sure whether they answer honestly. We have reason to think there might be bias because especially back in the days when the surveys were a paper Meant, uh, mailed to your house, it's not that different from a t filling out a tax form. So there might be a little biased information, but that's how we learn. We have other questions. Most of the compliance cost for individuals is time spent. How do we value that? Um, some tax compliance costs are voluntary. You, do, you spend more time on your taxes because you're thinking of ways to use loopholes. Others are involuntary. You've got to file. And it's hard to know what are marginal costs, especially for a business. A business has to calculate a lot just to know how the business is going. How much extra they ha do they have to do to calculate income for the tax authority? Well, it depends. It'll be different in different countries. It depends, for example, on how different the definition of income is for the tax authority compared to for a financial report. So there are multiple costs with taxation. I mentioned administrative costs, I mentioned compliance costs, but in graduate school, in economics, we spend most of our time thinking about a third cost I didn't put on the slides because it's a standard toolkit, but I should mention it, and that is the cost of taxation that come because people change their behavior and businesses change their behavior when we put on taxes. When we tax labor income, people might work less. When we tax the return to savings, they might save less. When we tax return to investment, businesses might invest less. Those are all costs of raising taxes. So that's in the standard toolkit. So I want to add to this uh, cost of distorting behavior, administrative and compliance costs. Now the standard toolkit takes into account these sorts of behavior responses, labor supply, savings, research and development. So what I want to talk about today is adding to the standard toolkit, some other kinds of behavioral response. So I mentioned Agnar Sanmo and his co-author had the first uh, positive analysis of tax evasion. So it's a model, it's the kind of model when you tell somebody about it when they're not an economist, they look at you like you're crazy. And the model is, well, how do I decide whether to evade taxes? Well, I make a decision under uncertainty. If I understate my income, there's some chance I won't be caught which case I'll have saved taxes. But there is a chance I will be caught, in which case I gotta pay up what I owe plus some penalty. So the model of Allingham and Sanmo is the same model essentially as a model of portfolio choice. In portfolio choice, you can choose between a safe asset and a risky asset. 
You have the risky asset, if things go well, you earn more. But if things go poorly, you earn less. So what they basically did is adopt to the economics of crime, and in this case, tax evasion, the standard model of portfolio choice. And what does the standard model of portfolio choice say will determine what your portfolio is, how risk averse you are, and what the, uh, the, ra the ratio of expected return to risk is. And so now we have a model of tax evasion which says whether I evade and how much I evade depends on how risk averse I am, what the chances are I'll get away with tax evasion are, and what happens if I get caught. So that's the modern model of uh, tax evasion. It's a little trickier if you apply it to a corporation, but I'll leave that aside. So that's sort of a deterrence theory of tax evasion. What deters tax evasion is probability of being caught and what the penalty would be. There are lots of non-deterrence theories out there, mostly by non-economist social scientists, but also by economist social scientists, which say, well, that can't be all there is. It can't just be a cost-benefit analysis. There are people who pay their taxes because of a sense of duty. They pay their taxes as out of a sense of altruism. They pay their taxes or not depending on whether they think the process of determining taxes is fair or not. There is not much empirical support to date for uh, these uh, non-deterrence theories outside of the laboratory. So in a lab laboratory, you can get uh, behavior that seems uh, close to duty or altruism or process. But outside of the la laboratory, in the real life situations, we have not found much evidence of these non-deterrence theories explaining the amount of tax evasion. But there's plenty of evidence for the deterrence theory. I mentioned to you that the compliance rate for wages and salaries is 99% in the US. It's 43% for self-employment income. Do I think that self-employed people are inherently more dishonest than wage employees? Not at all, or not substantially anyway. Every wage and salary earner in the US knows if they didn't report their income, they would be caught. They'd get a computer notice a month after they file their return. Every self-employed person knows it's very hard for the IRS to know what their true income is. So the difference in compliance rate between 99% and 43% is certainly due to the difference in the perceived probability of being caught. Um, empirical analysis of tax evasion, I've done a lot of work in this, so I can say it's challenging. One of my colleagues once said that empirical analysis of tax evasion to try to understand the determinants of it is very straightforward except for two things. You can't measure the right-hand side variables, and you can't measure the left-hand side variable. So I take that as a challenge, and it uh, requires some creativity. One way to go is what I call the traces of income approach. Um, I don't know if this uh, non-tax example will resonate in Spain, but in the United States, uh, people in their cars have radar detectors. So if they're speeding, they can tell if they're going to be caught. Well, the only reason you would have a radar detector is if you're planning on speeding, right? So one correlate with speeding is to look at the demand for radar detectors, right? It isn't illegal to have a radar detector, but you're darn sure it's correlated. It's a trace of that. So we can look at traces of tax evasion. I understand, um, I heard an anecdote since I've been here that apparently Spaniards uh, have a lot of 500 euro notes. Well. Uh, Probably the only reason to have 500 euro notes is if you're operating in the cash economy, thinking of not complying. And Pissarides and Weber have this wonderful paper where they have food consumption, and they relate food consumption to income, reported income, and they, know, and they make one assumption that the consumption of food as, uh, as a function of income is the same depending on regardless of your employment status. So whatever the percentage of your income you spend on food, it doesn't depend whether you're an employee or whether you're self-employed. But yet, the ratio of food consumption to reported income is much higher for self-employed people. So that means one of two things. Either self-employed people eat a lot more, or they're not reporting their true income. So it's the denominator that's too low. Um, and they estimate that about half of Self-employed income is not reported, which is consistent with the IRS studies. 
Another way to learn about um, evasion is randomized field experiments, which is all the rage in uh, many fields. It's, people in tax are a little, at a little bit of a disadvantage in this field because it is hard, maybe it's impossible, to get a tax authority to randomize tax rates. You would like to know how tax evasion, say, is it higher when tax rates go up? So you might think, well, just get Spain to uh, have different tax rates in different regions, and we'll just see if that changes behavior. Well, I hope you see that's not going to work in Spain. It's not going to work anywhere, actually. But what some tax authorities have done is to randomize aspects of enforcement. So they'll send, allow uh, researchers to send different letters reminding people of their tax liability to see which is more effective at getting people to comply. And this has been done on income tax. It's been done on value-added tax. It's been done with TV fees. And finally, the third promising development is the use of uh, administrative data. Mostly in Scandinavia, but now in the United States, researchers on a restricted basis are given access to the universe of tax return data in a country, which allows tremendous progress in research because the sample sizes are bigger than the samples that are public use data. And I understand there is some development here in Spain to allow research, researchers access to tax return administrative data. Let me say this is the wave of the future, and if you're interested in making progress on how the tax system affects people and corporations, this is a, a really valuable development. Avoidance. Oh, uh, I mentioned that avoidance are legal ways to reduce tax liability. So what do I mean? What are examples? You pay a tax professional to search for legal deductions. You arbitrage, meaning that there's two fairly similar assets which have different tax treatments, so you go long on one and you go short on the other. So you're not really taking a substantial position, but you're saving on taxes. You slightly retime a transaction when the tax law is uh, going to change from one year to the next. You slightly re-engineer a vehicle. So it's just on the low tax side of a definition. If a car is taxed more heavily than a truck, you change the vehicle so it's just a truck. And um, there are many, many examples of uh, such slight re-engineering of vehicles. And then there are interactions among responses. So I'm now going to talk about Puerto Rico as an example of this. Why in Puerto Rico, this uh, relatively low income territory, why did it have US companies that do electronics, pharmaceuticals, and high fashion? Some of you might have figured this out. My kids didn't, but they didn't try. Um, so I have to explain a little bit about what the tax system was then. It's changed since then. So Puerto Rico had a very low tax rate, corporate tax rate. And they addition, in addition had an agreement with the United States government. If a US corporation earned income in Puerto Rico, and then they repatriated the income to the United States. If this were a foreign country, the difference between the US tax rate and the home country, the host country tax rate would be owed. So let's say a US multinational invests in Ireland with a 12.5% tax rate. In principle, it's much more complicated, though. When the money comes back from Ireland, the difference between the US tax rate and the Irish tax rate is owed. So that would be 35 minus 12 and a half, 22 and a half percent more. Our, uh, Puerto Rico had a low tax rate, but they had an agreement with the US that when the money came back to the US, nothing more was owed. This made Puerto Rico a very attractive place for investment, US investment. But it made it particularly attractive for a particular kind of business, high margin. So what you want to be able to do is you, uh, if you're, a, say, a US pharmaceutical company and you have a plant in Puerto Rico, what you want to be able to do is to be able to claim that all the profits of this business were earned in the Puerto Rico firm. You want to push all the margin into Puerto Rico. And so the US parent company earn nothing, or maybe even made losses, you want to be able to say. It was the Puerto Rican company that earned all the profits. Low tax, no tax due when the money comes back to the US. So now I'll tell you what they did in the pharmaceutical plants my children and I saw as we were driving to our wonderful tourist destination. Now, I'm, and this is a, certainly an exaggeration. 
but I'll give you, this will get, give you the idea. So what happened in the Puerto Rico plant, no research and development, but the input was powder, the formula that had been discovered in New Jersey, where the, a lot of the companies were. And the assembly line in Puerto Rico, they would just compress the powder into a pill. And the output is a pill. Input powder, output pill. You would think that doesn't provide a lot of value added. Aha, but that depends on what price the parent charges the Puerto Rican subsidiary for the powder. Say they charge a very, very low price. Then it looks like all the profits are in the Puerto Rican subsidiary. It looks like the process that goes on in that plant is what's adding all the value. We know how much this went on because there was a court case many years ago about a U.S. drug company. And based on the information that became public, we know that the rate of return in this particular year for the Puerto Rican subsidiary of this firm was 135% annual return, and the parent was return was minus 14%. Now, you can bet it's not really that way. You can bet that the real value added is in the research to find the formula that goes on in New Jersey. But in order to take advantage of this, the U.S. company had to do something in Puerto Rico. There was real investment in Puerto Rico. There were real people working there. So this is an example of the interaction between tax avoidance, which is mostly what was going on here. This wasn't illegal except to push to an extreme. But to take advantage of that, you had to put a plant there and do something. So the interaction between the avoidance opportunities and the real investment were important. So I call this an avoidance facilitation, implicit subsidy to the real investment in Puerto Rico. The fact that once you had this plant in Puerto Rico, you could do this income shifting was key. So electronics, what happened there? Well, again, I'm exaggerating. But back in the days when there were diskettes, so the input was a blank diskette, and, the, and in the middle they just put the software on the diskette, and at the end came out the diskette with the software on it. So you might think there's not much value added from that, but that depends on what price was charged um, for, the, um, for the technology for the software. And if you set the prices right, it looks like that's where all the value is. And high fashion, well, maybe not all of you will agree with me, but if you think all the Value, uh, value of high fashion clothes is due to advertising, and it's not really a difference in the quality of the clothing. Well, the advertising expenses are all taken in the parent, against the parent, and uh, you can shift a lot of the income to uh, Puerto Rico where the clothes are made, and you charge very little for the, uh, the uh, apparel, costs very little, and you can sell it for a lot, and uh, all the income looks like it's in Puerto Rico. Um, I've uh, indicated that the withholding and information reporting are absolutely key to compliance. So I'll just give you uh, some percentage numbers here to, I hope, will convince you. In the United States, income tax for income where there's little or no information reporting, including small business, we think the non-compliance rate is 56 percent. When there's some information reporting, it's down to 11 and now skip down to 1 percent when there's both withholding and substantial information reporting. This is employee income, 1%. Let me say a little bit about public disclosure, because I mentioned it earlier. Um, in the United States, um, we, there was public disclosure of income tax for our first income tax, which came during the Civil War, the 1860s, and lasted about um, 10 or 20 years afterwards. And then again, after the modern US income tax was passed in 1913, we had it in the 20s and 30s, after which it was abolished. So we haven't had it since. I mentioned Scandinavian countries have it. Japan had it for 55 years and then abolished it, which, and the abolition uh, provided the data for a paper that I did, which I'll mention in a sec. It's, been, it's being seriously discussed in Australia and why, might, why is tax disclosure or public disclosure of tax an important policy instrument? Well, supporters of disclosure say it will reduce tax evasion and avoidance. So if your neighbor across the street, you happen to know that their business is doing very well, and you go on the internet in Norway and see that they report a very low income, maybe you will call the whistleblower line and say, you know, I, just, I think you should check. 
Um, and uh, supporters also think it improves policy transparency when you can see what, say, corporations report as taxable income. And opponents uh, uh, decry the loss of privacy and the negative attention brought to the affluent. The reason it was abolished in Japan, apparently, is that uh, ne'er-do-well people would find out who was rich and they would target their houses or bully the kids and that the outcry about this was enough that it was abolished. One hears in Colombia, it's a little bit off the topic, but in Colombia, one hears the following story that there is tax evasion uh, by the rich not to lower their taxes, but they're worried that the information will go to the wrong people and then they'll be, your kids will be kidnapped or they'll be targeted. So the relationship between privacy and taxes uh, certainly is why the U.S. doesn't have disclosure anymore. And so I've got a couple papers, one about Japan, about the abolition of tax disclosure in 2004, how it changed reported income, and a recent one about Norway, and I want to tell you what that's about because I think it's a neat idea. So Norway has had tax disclosure for over 100 years. What, they did, what happened in 2001 is that it got onto the internet. So what happened when it became really easy to look at other people's taxable income? Did it, can we see any effect on reported income? Well, you could just look at the change from the before the internet year and after the internet year, but graduate students among us will know that that isn't, doesn't usually convince people because lots of other things could have happened in that year. But we have either a perfect or a just acute uh, identification strategy, which is, it turns out in Norway, in, before the, it went on the internet, in some towns, like the Boy Scouts or the local soccer team, would copy the information from these catalogs that from the, pub, the books where the uh, information was available, make a little book of the local residents and sell it door to door to raise money for their soccer team. So it was very widely dispersed in some towns, but not others. So here's the research design. When they went to the internet, did it affect people in the towns that didn't have these catalogs more than in the towns where they did have the catalogs, where there was pretty good access? And the answer is yes, or I wouldn't be telling you about this. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and talk about uh, optimal tax systems. So this is about policy. So this is about the use of analysis to learn about tax policy. And I, th I hope it is obvious that if you're thinking about designing tax policy these days, you have to think about tax systems analysis. So I'll use Greece as an example. So Greece has to raise money. I can think of two generic ways to raise more taxes. Keep the base as it is and raise tax rates, or keep tax rates the same and crack down on tax evasion. Okay, there's lots of things in between. The standard tax analysis won't give you the answer to that because it doesn't look at uh, these multiple kinds of instruments, uh, including au more auditing or more information reports, et cetera. So I want to claim that an optimal tax systems approach changes the answers to classic optimal tax questions like how progressive should the tax system be, but it raises new questions that we couldn't answer before. How much resources should a country devote to enforcing its, its um, tax system? I already told you that our commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service made it seem like this was just minting money to give the IRS another billion dollars because it would reduce the deficit. They'd take the billion dollars, they'd raise seven billion, bingo, deficit's down by six billion. The implicit message is that means it's a good policy to give the IRS more money. The truth is it doesn't mean that at all because this is comparing apples and oranges. The apples are the billion dollars of real resource cost to, goes to the IRS, the people, the computers, et cetera. And the seven billion is a transfer. It's not new money to the economy. It's just transferring it from some non-compliant people, admittedly, to the government and then back to everyone. But it's not uh, new resources. So that, uh, it, to say that because you get $7, we'll raise $7 for every dollar you give us, that means it's a good policy? Wrong. 
what, here's an, uh, how, what's an optimal auditing structure? How do you collect information? How do you involve firms? If higher ta uh, tax rates on the rich would induce taxable income to move offshore, should we, does that mean we should abandon the attempt to increase top tax rates? Or does that mean we should crack down on the flight of capital? Or a little of both? This is the kind of question which I think is central to the tax policy of many countries that we can talk about with optimal tax systems. I said we have to bring firms into tax theory, and I said that if you read an intermediate tax textbook, you would think it just doesn't matter who remits the tax. There is a folk theorem in every public finance textbook. All the consequences of tax are the same, regardless of whether the tax is on the buyer or the seller. And uh, I can convince you that that's right, and then I'll convince you it's not right. And here's how I'm going to convince you it's right. Think of a retail sales tax. So in Michigan, there's a 6% tax on retail sales. So I'm going to use what uh, I call there the cup at the counter metaphor. So I'm going to convince you it doesn't matter who remits the tax. So I buy something for a dollar before tax, so I owe dollar $1.06. I'm the purchaser. So here's two things I could do. I could give a dollar and six pennies to the cashier. And then there's this little cup right at the counter, and it says tax collections. I could give the cashier one dollar and six pennies, and the cashier could put the six pennies in the cup. That's method one. Another method is I come to the cashier, I give the cashier a dollar, and I put the six pennies in the cup. In one case, the money is remitted by the firm. In the other case, it's remitted by the consumer. But you all know it's exactly the same. So that's the easiest way to convince yourself it doesn't matter which side of the transaction remits the tax. But now I can convince you of the opposite, and of course in many cases the opposite is true. Does it matter whether a firm remits the tax for its employees, or a retailer admits retail sales tax, or on the other hand, each employee has to remit the tax, or for a retail sales tax, each customer has to remit the tax, like at the end of the year, towed up their purchases and remit 6%. It would be a huge difference, and this is why we don't see a lot of variation in who remits tax across the world. It's always uh, firms. 150 plus countries in the world have a value-added tax. Only a couple have value, uh, retail sales taxes over 5%. In a textbook, the value-added tax and the retail sales tax are identical. There are both Uniform consumption taxes. 150 countries have a value-added tax. Nobody has a retail sales tax except maybe Brazil, over 10 percent. It's because the remittance is so much easier, in fact, maybe self-enforcing uh, for a value-added tax. So remittance matters. Why exempt small businesses? It happens all the time. In the U.S., there's no explicit exemption, but we know implicitly there is because the IRS just doesn't bother with most, most small businesses. We have a theorem from the classic uh, uh, optimal tax due to Diamond and Murley's Nobel Prize winners. It said, whatever you do in taxation, you shouldn't uh, do in, uh, enact any tax which uh, causes production inefficiency. So for example, you shouldn't have a tax which pushes production to small business from big business. So, that means that small business exemptions always are suboptimal in the standard theory. But once we introduce collection costs, it can be optimal because to, to the extent there's a per firm aspect of uh, collection costs, by exempting small businesses implicitly or implicitly, you're saving on those complex, uh, uh, costs because the cost per dollar raise is very high for small business. So there really is an incentive to focus uh, your collection on big businesses. Yes, one cost of that is production inefficiency, because it induces businesses to get just so small that the IRS ignores them. And in fact, the prediction is that you'll have a missing middle of firms that gets small to in, uh, avoid taxes, to avoid regulations that generally exempt small firms. That's a production inefficiency, but it could still be optimal. I started to go to seminars um, in the law school about taxation many years ago. And one thing I learned is that 
tax lawyers spend a lot of their time scuffling about drawing lines and interpreting lines. So let me give you some examples of what I mean. So in the U.S. and probably almost everywhere, the tax treatment of a corporation getting capital depends on whether it's debt, whether they borrow or they um, uh, raise uh, money through equity. It's much more favorable to get money through debt because the payments to the bondholders are deductible. So what determines what's debt and what's equity? And a lot of the MBA students from my university make a lot of money on Wall Street devising securities which for most intents and purposes are like equity, but they're just on the debt side of the definition from the tax authority. So this, I call this drawing a line. In, I'll give you a less important example. In Michigan, uh, sales tax, if you buy uh, uh, food at a restaurant, it's subject to sales tax. If you buy food at a grocery store, it's not subject to sales tax. So now we, you can go to these fancy grocery stores, and right after the cashier, there are tables, and there's silverware, um, and there's no sales tax, even though it's, it certainly looks like a restaurant to me. The standard theory suggests that uh, of optimal commodity tax and taxation suggests there should be different tax rates on every good, depending on things about the demand elasticity, but we know that's not feasible. Most tax systems that have commodity taxes have two or three rates. So an important uh, ta real tax policy question is how to draw the line between which goods are exempt, which goods are not exempt, and which goods are subject to the higher rate. And so it struck me that economists should be part of this debate about line drawing. And so this leads us to tax-driven product innovation. The car-like motorcycles I mentioned at the beginning, those are from Indonesia. Those are to be like a car but not be subject to the car tax. The car-like panel trucks, that was from Chile. That was, again, because trucks were tax exempt or lower tax and cars than cars. And so you make a panel truck and, and change it to uh, make it close to being a car. But it, those are not trivial in those countries, but a much more important example is this line between debt and equity, where a lot of resources go into getting just on the, on the tax-favored uh, uh, part. So let me uh, close by talking about the information revolution. I told you that tax at its essence is about information. We're having an information revolution. So let's start thinking hard about what it uh, means for taxation. So the most obvious but probably maybe the least important aspect of this is that the tax collection process is now computerized. Probably it's a higher percentage here, but in the U.S., 70 or 80 percent of individual income tax filers do it electronically. Most of them are using software. So that's a fact. That makes the process more efficient. Uh, but uh, let's think about what else it means. Let's look 10, 20 years down the road. Um, we, all, we have examples of how uh, computerization of information matters. In Finland, if you uh, are caught speeding, the fine that you owe depends on your income. So you get pulled over by the policeman, uh, gets your number, looks it up on his handheld or her handheld computer, and the fine depends on how wealthy you are. And the great example is there's some very rich Finn had a $140,000 speeding fine. So when we have a lot more information. We can do things uh, as a government that we couldn't do before. We can have smart cards for taxation so that the consumption tax rate depends on your income or how many dependents you have. Think about how that would work. Um, so these are examples of how computer uh, electronic availability of information can expand the options of the tax authority, but there are also ways where it can expand evasion opportunities, and I'll give you one example. Some of, I don't know if you've ever heard of zappers, but uh, this is maybe, well, maybe it works for value-added tax, so I've only thought about it for retail sales tax. So what's a zapper? So say I'm a restaurant, I get this software, and I put this uh, into my electronic uh, cash registers, and what the software does is it randomly eliminates some of the sales. So when the IRS comes to audit me, and I say, I, well, I only had this many receipts, and it says, well, I don't believe you. I want to see the computer records, and computer records back me up. These are called zappers. 
and they work wonders for retail sales tax. They work wonders for income tax because it also reduces net income. And um, so here's an example of what of uh, electronic uh, means for making tax evasion easier. And I use restaurants as an example because one of the big cases in the United States of use of zappers is a restaurant about a mile from my house. And what made it even more in the news is that apparently, allegedly, the money skimmed off from this restaurant went to support terrorists. So then everybody was suddenly interested. If it's tax, nobody cared. But if it's terrorism, everybody cared. So now I'm done. And now what I want to finish with is just go through the seven phenomena I started with. Now we now we can explain all of them. So let's won't be a quiz. OK, so new types of a motorcycle and panel trucks are examples of tax-induced product innovation. We changed the product to get it just on the low-tax side of the line. Or we changed the secure the way a company raises uh, capital to be just defined as tax, uh, as debt rather than equity. Basing a, a restaurant's income on the square footage of the restaurant or the number of tables is called the presumptive income tax. And that is a substitute, substituting what you really want to tax, income, but it's very difficult to measure the income of a restaurant, with something that's correlated with income, number of tables, square footage, where in the city the restaurant is, something that's correlated and more, e and e more easily measured. Simplified tax rules or no tax at all on business, small businesses, what that does is it economizes on administrative costs at the expense of production efficiency, right? It's pushing firms to be small. That's bad. They're smaller than they otherwise would be. But it saves the administrative costs uh, by the tax authority only having to deal with a small number of larger firms, which already have fairly sophisticated accounting. That an additional dollar added to its budget will generate $7.30 uh, $7 in additional tax revenue says nothing about the wisdom of increasing its budget. I didn't really prove that. I just told you it's apples and oranges. Trust me, it's correct. Over 150 countries levy a value-added tax, many at rates well above 10 percent or above 20 percent. None, with the one exception I mentioned, levies a retail sales tax at over 10 percent testifying, I believe, this is the clearest evidence you can imagine, that what are textbook equivalent taxes are not real world equivalent taxes. And the details of who remits the tax matters. Think about a value added tax as a system of withholding of tax and remittance of tax by businesses at different stages of production and distribution. We know withholding matters. A value added tax is an example of that. With limited withholding and information reporting possible, the self-employed, especially those operating in cash businesses, are the final frontier of tax compliance. I told you what the IRS has recently done, forcing the credit card companies to report to the IRS uh, the receipts of businesses. And I have uh, talked at great length about my adventure, the Slimrod family in Puerto Rico, when my kids didn't want to talk to me about this. but. Uh, the U.S. corporations found real investments, putting real factories in Puerto Rico, uh, attractive because it facilitated this income shifting to low tax Puerto Rico and lowered their worldwide tax liability. Um, Frank Hahn, the British theorist, once said that optimal tax formulas are either guides to action or nothing at all. If they're going to be guides to action, I'm totally convinced we have to expand how we do taxation to include these. Uh, phenomena and the formulas and the standard tax analysis is far from the reality of the world that we face. And we need to expand our analysis to these issues that are prominent in the formulation and implementation of all countries' tax policies. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're gonna, I can't move so far. Oh, you put it on once after I yeah, said? No, you can you can take it in your pocket. Okay.
since uh, we have some time for some questions. Uh, let me first say that this was uh, an incredible talk. I enjoyed it a lot and have a lot of questions and answers, actually. But let's hear the audience. Thomas. Thank you very much for your excellent uh, uh, lecture. Uh, uh, how we should think about shadow economy and uh, evasion uh, in times of crisis? Uh, uh, becoming uh, bigger or becoming or shrinking like the economy, like the, the, the known and official GDP? Uh, I've, I've heard different views on that. And I'm sure your, uh, your research and your experience has seen many different, uh, different behaviors or, uh, well, uh, I, I think this is a matter which is probably difficult to, uh, to, to quantify, but uh, it's yes. really very interesting, especially for us in Spain where yep. a shadow economy is considered to be huge. So let me first agree with your point that it's difficult to measure. I have a paper about how to uh, do empirical work about tax evasion and the title is Evidence of the Invisible. So that, uh, that summarizes how tricky it is. So I think um, I can say two things. One is the positive question, how would the crisis affect the informal economy? And second, the normative question, how should policy toward tax evasion change when the informal, when you go into a crisis? So uh, the first one I haven't thought much about, but uh, if I um, had to predict, uh, I would say the informal economy would uh, expand relative to the formal economy as uh, there are more layoffs. People are looking to survive and support themselves so that it's easier to find informal work. On the policy side, I think it probably makes it more important to uh, enforce the informal economy because the crisis came with it, a uh, crisis in revenue raising. And we know, uh, well, we know in most countries, I can't speak for Spain directly, that um, there is a lot of untaxed income there. So I would, I think that uh, implies that the optimal amount of enforcement goes up in a crisis. And so this is kind of choice I said that Greece and maybe Spain faces. You need to raise revenue. You do it by raising taxes with the current base and the current level of enforcement? Probably not. If you're going to increase tax rates, you should at the same time increase enforcement because otherwise you're going to drive even more people. The, uh, the reduction in the tax base will be even bigger. More questions? I just had a question more about sort of um, which legal framework would allow for more sort of tax loopholes because I had remember a long time ago, so now it's going to sound like more of an anecdote than anything else, um, reading about how um, the al Fayed family in the UK paid almost like no taxes to the government because of all the fiscal loopholes given that it's common law. But then... Um, reading sort of about more recent research about the fiscal system in France. Um, Piketty was sort of underlining how like the rich managed to have loads of tax evasions in a sort of more codified um, type of legal system. So I was just wondering in your opinion, um, which one and which of those sort of legal systems and had the importance of a legal framework for maybe sort of tax loopholes? Yeah, that's a great question about which I know nothing. But I thank you for emphasizing my uh, lack of knowledge in that area. I'm an economist. I do talk to lawyers more than most economists about taxation. But I haven't given much thought to that question. I can answer the question I thought you were going to ask. I thought you were going to say, once you mentioned the Al-Fayed family, you were going to say, why didn't I talk anything about uh, the use of cross-border transactions to facilitate evade. Can I answer that? You wanted to ask that too, right? <laughs> and so the answer is yes, there, it's very important, especially for corporations and high wealth individuals. And to, um, I didn't talk about it all today, but uh, it requires probably better cross-country coordination of tax systems, not necessarily 
with the basis and the rates, but the exchange of information. Because as I said, information is really the base of uh, the, uh, the critical element of uh, taxation. Uh, so that I have an answer to. Thank you for asking the second part. Um, thanks. I just had um, kind of two questions related more to the structure of taxes. Uh, I'm not a tax expert myself, but um, what I was wondering is, do you think the way that we structure taxes at the moment is sufficient to manage equity concerns, particularly for the rich? So um, less of a focus on assets, more on income. Um, and um, related to that, I've just gone blank what my other question was. So. So now they'll add up to two questions. Should I answer the first one while you think about the second one? Um, well, of course, that's a, a great and topical question about um, whether the progressivity of tax systems is sufficient. This is a question that economists tend to, most economists tend to stay away from because, uh, and I'm one of them, because I believe that economists have no comparative advantage in talking about equity, uh, vertical equity, and fairness. So my view is the economists should give menus to politicians. If, if you have this level of progressivity, this will be the impact in the economy. If you have this other level, this will be the impact. And then through the political process or whatever, there's a choice about how progressive the tax system should be. Your question was whether the tax structure is sufficient to uh, achieve the level of equity you want. So I think in the U.S., the tax system, which is based on income, we have no uh, wealth tax, although we have local property tax, is sufficient to get a uh, considerable amount more progressivity. Uh, our top tax rate is now 35% uh, at the federal rate. It could be higher. We could, uh, the top tax rate on capital gains is now 20%. Capital gains are earned largely by high-income people. It could be higher. So I, I think in the United States, the tax structure is not the constraint for more progressivity. It's actually the politics that are con the constraint. Um, there was something implicit in your talk related to marginal tax rates, where you talked about um, the fact that self-employed businesses have a fairly low um, reporting rate of tax liability and and so I guess an increase in, com in compliance would sort of be like an additional tax on them to some extent and so when we speak about base and rates as you said like we we should take these effects into account so to what extent do you see that happening in the political sphere that that the talk sort of moves away from a, a mere focus on sort of nominal rates that are that are raised and rather more on and sort of these implicit marginal rates that, that come from, for example, increasing compliance? Yeah, that's a, a very good question, and one that, in the, for the US anyway, is sort of outside the level of political discourse. Um, so let's talk about economics first, then we can talk about politics. So of course, the effective level of taxation depends not only on the statutory rates, but on the extent to which those rates are enforced. And if we keep the rates the same, and we in, uh, increase enforcement, that is an increase in the effective tax rate. That's absolutely right. But if you're talking about efficient allocation of resources, you need to give me an argument why there should be a lower effective tax rate on small business than on other income. People have offered such arguments, and I've never been convinced. So I would think that cracking down on noncompliance for small business moves the effective tax rate toward where it should be. That's not to say it doesn't reduce the return of being a small businessman, but I don't see a good reason why uh, we should induce resources to move into small business uh, for that reason. Political discourse, um, most politicians in the US won't explicitly say that we endorse evasion because it reduces the effective tax rate on certain sectors such as small business. They, they won't be so bold as to say that explicitly. Um, they will certainly talk about when there's policy discussion of raising income tax rates, they will say, well, this will especially hit the small business sector and uh, reduce the engine of growth in the United States. But they usually won't refer to the, these facts about compliance rates. Um, 
Um, I, I had a question regarding like when you speak about uh, probably imposing more enforcement tools um, in countries like I'm from Argentina, informality is like really spread out, and I always wonder about if it should be a sudden change, a uh, pre-announced change, or a progressive change, because it, it sounds like something that would really, really affect real economy. And also, uh, if you can mention something about how uh, different economies regarding the structure of the economy, like we have a lot, of, like 90% of our firms are small size firms, and the cost of compliance for those firms is much higher than for big firms. And okay. yeah, probably that has something to do with it. Okay, so let me try to remember. There was a lot of questions there. So first question was, was if there is a major change in enforcement of small business, should, be done, should it be done gradually or overnight? Well, I think the political reality is you can't do something like that overnight. There has to, I don't know about the Argentine political system, but there would have to be discussion. And if it's a huge change, it almost certainly would have to be done gradually. And um, I can see reasons for surprising people, but I'm fine with gradual. Okay, second question was, how does what I said depend on the structure of the economy? And you mentioned that 90% of businesses in Argentina are small. That is an endogenous statistic. One reason 90% of businesses in Argentina are small is because they get around, they don't, are not subject to regulation and taxes. This is the missing middle I was talking about in many developing countries. That you have an incentive to be just small enough that you stay below the radar of both the tax authority and the regulatory authorities. So it wouldn't necessarily be 90 if there was a different system of enforcement. Um, but yes, it does generally, so I'll make that point, but yes, it's, I think it's certainly true that the tax policy that you want does depend on the structure of the economy. Say if in Argentina's comparative advantage was in businesses and in industries that favored small businesses as opposed to you know, steel or telecommunications where there's natural reasons to be big, that does affect the tax policy. So I think the short answer to your question is yes, the tax structure does matter. Lots of questions. Thank you. Uh, you hear a lot about. Uh, Is it all Americans here, by the way? Guilty. We're an international. Two, right? <laughs> I heard at least two. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Guilty. Two. Yeah, no, I, I'm from Boston. Um, but you hear a lot Go about. Red Sox, right? Yes, World Series. Sorry, there's a little sports, <laughs> little sports talk here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you hear a lot about simplifying tax code everywhere, um, but but as you mentioned, that a lot of the deductions and and credits have you know, um, motives to increase investment or the mortgage deduction, you know, things like this. In your opinion, all things considered, which deductions or, or credits um, are the most distortionary and which, if you could eliminate any of them, would, would you? Well, I can answer that only from an American perspective. So the biggest um, deduction or exemption in the United States is the exemption of employer-provided health care. It's a huge, uh, it's a hundred billion dollar plus per year cost in tax revenue. I would get rid of that one first. I happen to be, um, can, I, can I say the word hard ass here? Okay. I happen to be a hard ass when it comes. I would uh, be pretty uh, orthodox about getting rid of a lot of uh, uh, special preferences. Now, that doesn't mean that we should do what some politicians have suggested in the US, which is get rid of all business deductions. Well, that's crazy. Legitimate cost of doing business, we need to keep them. There are some others that there are good economic reasons to subsidize, like research and development. I'd keep that credit. But um, for a lot of the exemptions and deductions which are there to subsidize or favor particular activities or particular sectors, I'd get rid of most of them. State and local income tax deduction would be gone if I were in charge. Charitable deduction, gone. So I'm pretty hard at uh, Tomas had another question. Well, uh, I w it was a related question. Uh, the thing was, uh, was uh, 
uh, how likely do you think it is that we see a significant progress in uh, homogenization uh, of taxation in, across uh, different countries in, in Europe in the coming years? Well, um, let me ask, answer a different question first. How likely will we see significant tax reform in the United States in the coming years? Very little, very low chance. If they can't agree on a continuing resolution to keep the government open, there's no way they're going to agree <laughs> on a major tax reform. No way. And my son works in the Senate, and he agrees with me. Or I agree with him, actually. Um, uh, so your question was whether there would be, like, do I think it'd be likely there'd be significant tax reform in Europe, European countries? Well, I don't know enough about the, um, what's going on in different countries. I, I sense that there have been some significant reforms toward more progressivity and towards more enforcement of the tax system. So we've, I think we've already seen that in a lot of countries. Um, whether you call that tax reform or tax you know, malform, or whether that's going in the wrong direction, I don't know. Um, it seems also to me, but you would know better than me, that the uh, movement toward harmonization of European tax systems seems to have lost its steam uh, when, uh, in the wake of the crisis. A few years ago, somebody who I think very highly of told me he thought the common corporation base would happen in a few years, this was a few years ago. I, my understanding is that it's not on the horizon anymore. Uh, so there have been some movements toward information sharing among countries because they're, they are trying to minimize uh, movements of uh, tax revenue outside their, the country towards tax havens. So I can see slight movement of European, comma, high tax countries, comma, uh, in sharing information to reduce the use of tax havens, but I don't see much beyond that. More questions? Actually, I do have a question. Um, we're talking about this uh, fact that, um, you know, if you spend a, a million dollars in, uh, you know, in uh, going against tax evasion, and then you may increase your revenues quite a lot, but you cannot count it on on that way. But if you do that, you're going to get, you're going to be maybe able to reduce some taxes that distort the economy. So are you taking that into account? I mean, it's a, you know, in Spain, um, there is a, a large belief in Spain, for example, that few people pay a lot of taxes and many people pay very little. Mm -hmm. And that that distorts the economy a lot. So investing a little bit on tax evasion would be highly profitable socially. Mm -hmm. um, so I am taking that into account. So let me tie your question with an earlier question. So if you crack down on tax evasion, those people you're cracking down on, they fa face a higher effective tax rate. So, all, so um, mm -hmm. whatever uh, distortions you think you're lightening because you can lower other taxes, you're increasing those distortions. That's not to say it's not worth anything, but it's not a pure gain. It's a gain because you might have a better allocation of resources away from the sectors that got resources just because you could get away with tax evasion toward other sectors. So that's yeah. not zero, but it's not measured by the revenue you get. Mm -hmm. And if you were going to then ask how do you measure it, I would say that's complicated. I have some papers on it, but it's, it's not easy. It's not a, you can't just look it up in a budget. Mm -hmm. Another question. <laughs> it's sort of a follow-up to what you just said and, and some things you said earlier. Um, so what would you say sort of the, the perspective in the literature on time-variant tax rates, like from a macroeconomic perspective? Is there some kind of point to maybe having tax rates that vary with certain macroeconomic variables? What would be the sort of optimal system for that? Yeah, I have, as in the introduction suggest, in my introduction suggested, I tend to be on the practical end of uh, tax policy. So that, uh, for people like me, that stayed in the uh, realm of theoretical papers. So I have seen interesting suggestions where there should be automatic um, changes in, in the tax rate structure depending on the state of the economy. The U.S. Congress would never agree to that, never. And I, 
Um, so it's just not going to happen in my country. And do you know of a country where it, it could happen, where the legislative process would just give in to some automatic mechanism where tax rates would automatically go up or down? It's just not going to happen. Not in my lifetime, which is, of course, different than your lifetime. <laughs> Okay, um, so I think we're ready for the cup of cava, and before that, I really want to thank you, Joe, for thank being you here. All. It's been a great lecture. Thanks a lot.